I defy anyone to go read 10,000 comments on my YouTube channels and not come away uh, with a... <laughs> what a nightmare. Oh, no. <laughs> what a nightmare. Uh, I defy anyone to go read 10,000 comments on my... I cannot imagine a more perfect tell, Mr. Peterson. All right, let's see the uh, the Ben Shapino and Jordan Peterson new team up. It sounds like a good name for a sitcom, Ben and Petey. Speaking a moment ago about the, the sort of lack of meaning people are looking for, particularly young men, and it really is a, a, a big thing that young men seem to have lost meaning. Postmodernism killed the, the scientific rationalist world, and the postmodernists have decided to substitute for that a certain utopian vision of the remolding of American society. In, in terms of what they call equity, but but really amounts to tribal dynamics. That's fun hearing from the group that refuses to listen to the scientific consensus when it is like concerns trans issues. Then it's just like, oh, we're not totally sure. I mean, the science is kind of out on this one. You know, we, we don't really like I, I just I'm going to keep spouting off that it's child abuse to give kids hormone blockers, even though it's been proven to really help gender dysphoria and lower suicidal ideation. But hey, I'm, I'm just going to keep on talking out of my ass. And, and you, you see this over and over that the radical left pushing its own version of utopianism. Classical liberals have been wrong-footed, I think, by the need for something more fulfilling, which is why classical liberalism always relied on an unspoken assumption that you were going to find meaning in your family, you were going to find meaning in religious community, you were going to find meaning in bettering your social life outside of government. But when that unspoken understanding just dissipated, when, when religion started to, to fall apart, all that was left was, well, let's just be rational with one another. There's not much inspiring there. And I think that's why you see that ac across the board, a drive toward irrationalism, uh, a certain level of romanticism dominating the society to the point where irrationalism is much more prized than rationalism. If you make a, a rational point, if you cite data, very often this is now considered not only in politic, but, but damaging and dangerous. And by the way, again, we're dealing, whoa, well, now with two individuals. We're dealing with two individuals who don't do that. That's like more often than not between conservatives libs and the left i see the left are the ones who are having to provide overwhelming amount of data to back up their arguments when it's like uh okay well i'm going to talk about economics i'm not really uh, well versed in economics it's usually like a right-wing dominated field but i guess i have to do this to indicate to you what the problems are inherent to capitalism so here we go we're going to describe all these things hey i want to talk to you about trans rights and trans issues i'm gonna to have to look at the overwhelming consensus of the medical community when it comes to their findings on this and it seems yes it is actually actually a good thing to give uh, or provide hormone blockers uh, for children who are experiencing gender dysphoria it really helps with that uh, it turns out climate change is real you know I don't know if you all saw Jordan Peterson's latest breakdown where he was just going off with like people keep talking about climate change and bringing up that it, that it's a, it's a bad thing and it really it really makes people stressed and you don't understand how terrible the, what that does to young men and young minds it's just the worst thing the other thing that that ideology does and the the radical leftists are all, also very good at this is that do not become addicted to ideology everyone do not drink from the cup of ideology provides you with a locale a convenient locale for the for the uh, existence of evil and so if you reflexively identify the patriarchy with evil, well, first of all, that's a powerful idea. It's it, independent of its broad merit. It's, a, it's true. Now, it's not the only truth, and it's not the complete truth, but it's true. The reason it's true is because every hierarchical... I kind of want to just run the credits there, and, and, and that's the end. <laughs> system, hierarchical system, degenerates tends to degenerate in the direction of power. And all hierarchical systems are less than they could be. And that's partly because of the possibility that power and deceit will corrupt them, but also partly because we're willfully blind and deceitful in our own personal lives. And so when you tell young people that the cause of the trouble they see around them in the world, and maybe even the disquiet in their own heart, is the malevolent inadequacy of their society, that rings true. And they don't hear the rest of the story, you know, and the rest of the <laughs> That white people have built the best civilization known in human history, and that they should be able to rule others. That's, why, why, why won't you accept that? The story that I've been trying to tell, they don't hear the story that, yeah, don't forget about the evil and corruption that exists in your own heart. And don't forget about the fact that nature 
in this wondrous goddess as portrayed by the <laughs> anti-human <laughs> environmentalists. Oh, no. And I, by that, I don't mean Gaia. all environmentalists, by the way. That wonderful goddess nature is also trying to make you ill and kill you at all times. And so, but the story that corruption exists... In Again, he's always attacking ghosts. I was like, who, who are these people who are just like, uh, yes, we have a lot of problems. We have to destroy the patriarchy. We have to end white supremacy and then burn nature to the ground. Nature is also evil, the biggest enemy of all. In hierarchical structure. And that that's a consequence of malevolence, the malevolent use of power and deceit. That's true. So it's very motivating, especially if you're young and you're looking for an adventure. Now, it's also too convenient, which is one of its tri tremendous dangers, because unless you're taught to look within and identify the malevolence there as the primary moral obligation, then you now have an excuse and a moral justification to take out all of your negative emotion, your hostility, your resentment, everything about you that's unexamined on the demonic enemy. And so basically, rather than the systems itself oppressing people, what really oppresses everyone is themselves. That's that's the, the one truth that no one really seems to be able to acknowledge that you you are the oppressor of yourself and you're just choosing to, you know, break out and, and, and get mad, big mad at things like capitalism, patriarchy. But truly, it, it is you. You have not looked within. Of course, that's that that, that degenerates with extraordinary rapidity as we as we've seen over and over and over. So it's up to the it's up to the centrists on both sides to And don't get me wrong, I've said this, I've acknowledged this. I think that every single one of you should become the best versions of yourselves that you can be. That includes things like God, those communists are amazing. I wonder if you threw a glass of apple cider on Jordo if he'd melt away Wizard of Oz star. <laughs> oh no, the cider uh mercy <laughs> The horror the horror <laughs> <laughs> the side. <laughs> Thank you, the big room, uh, for gifting a, a tier one subscription. <laughs> oh, I, t I totally lost my train of thought there. To deal with this, I've been talking to a lot of the optimist rationalist types on my podcast. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I, I should I should uh, express this thought. It is it is it is it is a good thing and a good piece of advice uh, and one that is not only given by uh, Jordan uh, PD, uh, but lots of other people that yes, you should be the best version of yourself. Uh, cleaning up your room is good. Washing, cleaning yourself is good. Exercising regularly uh, if you can is, is very good as well. Uh, these are all good pieces of advice. And again, to become the best version of yourself as possible. That being said, it doesn't matter how sparkling and shiny your clean room is. Uh, if you are born into abject poverty, most likely you are going to remain in abject poverty. That's that's it do doesn't matter if you if you shine your room every single day. Can you climb out of that? Yes, there are uh, times when people manage to do that. They, and everyone loves those stories. They love uh, the rags to riches stories. That is uh, the ones that are always touted, uh, you know, all over. Uh, conservatives love them as well because it proves to them that capitalism works, right? It's like, well, yes, this person, look, uh, they had all, all of the things that all these lefties are always saying would oppress you i mean this person happens to uh, have grown up in poverty uh they're a black american uh they are they're gay and yet they rose to the top and now they're a neurosurgeon and so look it is, anyone can do it it's just personal responsibility every single person who hasn't achieved that is 100 percent on them matt ridley and bjorn lomberg and well and height and, and pinker more more distantly but more recently pinker uh, is a great lomberg example and, of that and ridley for, and for justifying and, uh, capitalism marion tupi who who's written a lovely book on uh Human progress, uh, 10 things everyone needs to know about human progress. It's something like that, huh? Anyways, one of the things we discussed consistently was the difficulty in promoting the message that all three of these men are very aware of, which is that from a material perspective, in terms of absolute privation worldwide, humanity is way better off on virtually every dimension you could possibly measure than ever. And and most of that That's improvement has occurred in the last 40 years, and it's been revolutionary Pinker. in its speed. And no one knows this. 
And so Oh no no, Every, everyone here is Newtonian. It is it's basically the creed that all capitalists like to like to uh, celebrate. And it doesn't matter if they're libs as well. Libs like to celebrate it as, as well. If you look at the metrics, it seems like in every single thing, uh, literacy rates have gone up, uh, mortality has gone down, we don't war as much. Uh, they don't add the fact that there is uh, an increase in the amount of time that people work, the incredible increase in uh, the amount of mental stress people are having, the incredible increase in the rises of things like suicide, uh, in medication. Um, the fact that people are basically working themselves, grinding themselves, sigma grind setting themselves to the bone doesn't really ever apply to someone like Jordan Peterson. It also, if you want to just go towards debunking Steven Pinker, uh, if you remove China from a lot of his uh, analytics uh, and the progress that China has single-handedly made, and I know that would seem like a weird thing for someone who, uh, again, isn't probably too fond of communist China, but if you remove it from a lot of their statistics, everything suddenly plummets. And this is also to do with the fact that he uh, utilizes that rule, uh, the $2 a day rule, and how most people have moved out of extreme poverty because of that, without putting into account the relativity of that amount with other um, uh, economic uh, disparities and uh, the way different countries work. That is another thing that Steven Pinker likes to do. But he's been thoroughly debunked at this point on a lot of those cases. A lot of the gains made in the West that we all love and uh, enjoy here, they're made at the expense of the exploitation of people in other countries. Uh, the, extra, uh, the extraction of resources of people in other countries, Central and South America, a lot of countries in Africa, uh, for us to be able to have this higher quality of life for our Western Judeo-Christian values to enjoy. And uh, even then, we still can't get the PS5s. So it's very important to know, to try to think through why that is. Like, that's such a positive message. Now, the United States has fallen in the most, uh, in most criteria, like infant mortality, life expectancy, literacy. Well, that's, that sounds like uh, postmodern neo-Marxist propaganda to me. I talked to Russ. They don't make men's voices like Corpse Husband anymore. I, I love Corpse Husband's voice. It's, uh, he's got a really cool voice. Russell Brand about this, and I'm bringing him up for a reason. He's, he's a lefty by temperament and by heart. And <laughs> He's a lefty by temperament. I guess, I guess I agree with you there. It seems like a weird and arbitrary thing to say. You can, you can have all the temperament of a leftist, but if you espouse a whole bunch of things that align with the right, and uh, usually in the conspiratorial side of the internet, then yeah, you're probably going to get labeled as those things. Like, it doesn't matter what your temperament is. <laughs> <laughs> his first objection, but he's very thoughtful and quick. His first objection, you know, I pointed out all this data showing that by every possible objective measure, everything is way better than it was certainly 100 years ago, but certainly even 20 years ago, um, even on the environmental front in the main. And he <laughs> said, well, what about disparity of distribution? So there's the problem of absolute level of wealth, let's say. That's improving. But there is still tremendous disparity. And of course, all right, if he's going to be using uh, Steven Pinker so much, we have to once again dust off this old sign. Uh, his book has incited strong reactions, both positive and negative. On one hand, Bill Gates has, for example, effervesced that it's my new favorite book of all time. On the other hand, Pinker's been fiercely exonerated or excoriated, sorry, by a wide range of leading thinkers for writing a simplistic, incoherent pinane uh, to the dominant world order. John Gray in The New Statesman calls it embarrassing and feeble. David Bell, writing in The Nation, sees it as a dogmatic book that offers an oversimplified, excessively optimistic version of human history. Uh, George Monbiot of The Guardian laments the poor scholarship and motivated reasoning that insults the Enlightenment principles he claims to defend. Besides, I agree with what, uh, much of what Pinker has to say. His book is stocked with 75 charts and graphs that provide incontrovertible evidence for centuries of progress on many fronts that should be a matter to all of us. An inexorable decline in violence of all sorts, along with equally impressive increases in health, longevity, education, and human rights. It's precisely because the validity of much of Pinker's narrative that the flaws in his argument are so dangerous. They're concealed under such a smooth layer of data and eloquence that they need to be carefully unraveled. That's why my response to Pinker is to meet him on his own turf. In each section, like him, I rest my case on hard data exemplified in a graph. Graph number one. In November 2017, around the time Pinker was likely putting the final touches on his manuscript, over 15,000 scientists from 184 countries issued a dire warning to humanity. Because of our overconsumption of the world's resources, they declared we are facing widespread misery and catastrophic biodiversity loss. They warned that time is running out. Soon it will be too late to shift course away from our falling trajectory. They included nine sobering charts and carefully worded, extensively researched uh, analysis showing that on a multitude of fronts, the human impact on Earth's biological systems is increasing at an unsustainable rate. Three of those alarming graphs are shown here. The rise in CO2 emissions, the decline in available freshwater, and the increase in the number of ocean dead zones from artificial fertilizer runoff. This is not much. Uh, this is not the first such notice. 25 years earlier, 1992, 1,700 scientists, including the majority of living Nobel laureates, sent a similarly worded warning to the government leaders of the world, calling for recognition of the Earth's fragility of a new ethnic... Uh, 
uh, oh, sorry, ethic arising from the realization that we are all but one lifeboat. The current graphs starkly demonstrate how little the world has paid attention to this warning since 1992. Taken together, these graphs illustrate ecological overshoot. The fact that in the pursuit of material progress, our civilization is consuming the Earth's resources faster than they can be replenished. Overshoot is particularly dangerous because of its relatively slow feedback loops. If your checking account balances approach to zero, you know that if you keep writing checks, they will bounce. In overshoot, however, it's as though our civilization keeps taking out bigger and bigger overdrafts to replenish the account, and then we pretend these funds and income celebrate our continuing progress. In the end, of course, the money runs dry and the game is over. Pinker claims to respect science, yet he blithely ignores 15,000 scientists' desperate warning to humanity. Instead, he uses blatant rhetorical techniques to ridicule the paint on those concerned, an overshoot of a quasi-religious ideology laced with misanthropy, including an indifference to starvation and an indulgence in ghoulish fantasies of a depopulated planet, and Nazi-like comparisons of human beings to vermin, pathogens, and cancer. He then uses a couple of the most extreme examples he can to create a swath of straw men to buttress his character. These are issues worthy of debate on the topic of civilization and sustainability, but to approach the subject with such seriousness with emotionally and rhetoric is morally inexcusable and striking evidence of Mombia's claim that Pinker insults the Enlightenment principles he claims to defend. Progress, but for whom? At one point, Pinker describes, despite the world's roots, humanism doesn't exclude the flourishing of animals, but this book focuses on welfare of humankind. That's convenient because any non-human animal that might not agree with the past 60 years, there's been a uh, period of flourishing. In fact, the world's GDP has increased 22-fold since 1970. There's been a vast die-off of creatures with whom we share the Earth. As shown in Figure 2, human progress and material consumption has come at the cost of 58% decline in vertebrates, including a shocking 81% reduction in animal populations and freshwater systems. For every five birds or fish that inhabited a river or lake in 1970, there is now now, just one. But, you know, fuck them creatures. Incarceration rates skyrocket in recent decades. So that one's going up. Pinker doesn't like to talk about that. Historical incarceration rates of African Americans. Source, the Washington Post. A rising tide lifts all boats. Uh, this brings us to one of the crucial errors in Pinker's overall analysis. By failing to analyze his top-level numbers with discernment, he unquestionably propagates one of the great neoliberal myths of the past several decades, that a rising tide lifts all boats. Afraid he unashamedly appropriates for himself as he extols the benefit of inequality. This has been an argument used by the original and instigators of neoliberal laissez-faire economics, Ronald Reagan, Margaret Thatcher, to cut taxes, privatize industries, and slash public services with the goal of increasing economic growth. Pinker makes two key points here. First, he argues that income inequality is not a fundamental component of well-being, pointing to recent research for people that are comfortable with different rewards for different, depending on their skill and effort. However, Pinker himself acknowledges humans do have a powerful predisposition towards fairness. They all want to feel that if they work diligently, they can be successful. Someone who works based on what they do, not on what their family is born into. More uh, equal, uh, sorry, equal societies are also healthier, which is condition conspicuously missing from current economic models, where the divide between the rich and the poor has become so gaping that the six wealthiest men in the world, including Pinker's friend Bill Gates, now own as much wealth as the entire bottom half of the world's population, and that's increasing. Pinker's fall by, fallback might be with the second point, the rising tide argument which extends to the global economy. Here he cheerfully recounts the story of how Branko Milanovic, the world-leading ex-bank economist, uh, analyzed gains made by percentile across the world over the 20-year period, 18, 1988 to 2000, discovering that something has become widely known as the elephant graph because of its shape resembling the profile of an elephant with a raised trunk. Contrary to popular belief about the rising global inequality, it seems to show that the top 1% did in fact gain more than their fair share of the income, lower percentiles of global population. Like, income inequality is growing globally that it doesn't take more than the, the fact that again if six human beings own the collective wealth of half the planet there's a problem this is the uh the elephant graph versus income levels that they're trying to show the elephant graph elegantly conceals the fact that the wealthiest 1% experience nearly 65 times the absolute income growth as the poorest of the world's half of the population. Inequality isn't in fact decreasing at all, but growing extremely rapidly in the other way. Jamal Dean has calculated that at its current weight, it would take over 250 years for the income of the poorest 10% to merely reach the global average of $11 a day. By that time, at the current rate of consumption, the wealthy nations it's safe to say that there would be nothing left for them to spend their lucrative earnings on. In fact, the rising tide has some barely equates to the top of the bucket for billions of others. The Measuring Genuine Progress one it breaks down that. What has improved in global health also breaks down that. False equivalencies, false dichotomies breaks down that. If you want to go through all this, by the way, because you've got people who are overwhelmingly uh, talking about how Steven uh, Pinker is God and that his uh, word should be taken as gospel, please refer to them. That That is fair enough. You could even point out that the role of the left is to provide a conscientious voice for for, that's constantly attending to the fact of continuing disparity regardless of absolute level of wealth, and, and fair enough. But, but having said all that, it's a great mystery that incremental optimism is not sufficiently motivating. And you can't just wish human nature is going to change. It's not going to change. We got to tell a better story. 
And I also think that's why I'm a target, I think, is because I am actually trying to tell a better story and I'm actually having some success with it. So I totally agree with that. And, and that really does bring us to the book because one of the things that folks should know about all of your books is that they are very intimate, very personal. Now you talk about yourself, but you also speak in, in a way that most writers do not. You use second person pronouns. I mean, you speak directly to the reader. You say, you feel this way. You think this way. And a lot of people read that and say, I do think that way. This is a person who's speaking directly to me in a way that you know, mainstream political books very often do not. They consider me sort of a widget in whatever ideology they're pushing or, or they, they're considering the, the value of systems or not systems. But you sort of end around that. And I think that in many ways, that's what men, members of the left find so, so threatening is because if you're a member of the left and you believe that all individuals are essentially just the outgrowths of institutions and therefore that all change by individuals is going to be insufficient and that it must be societal change that, that creates individual change, you're a threat because you're telling people, well, you know, the systems can certainly get better, but the main threat to you is you. And that is a deeply threatening message to people. And if people find fulfillment in that message, then the left really does have a problem because if people start improving their lives within the system and not blaming the system for their problems. Isn't this exactly what I talked about? It's, 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 it's the exact thing. It's that every single person, if you improve your lives yourselves, if you climb out of abject poverty, then it proves the system works. And instead, recognizing that that they can improve their lives. It's a you That's problem. What mem members of the left tape most of all. You know, you talk. I mean, if you uh, you know have trouble finding a job you like, find a better job. If you have trouble finding a home to live in, just move. Go to a different area. Just continuously. It, it sounds like a you problem. Talk about in the book, Jordan, the fact that people are constantly coming up to you and they're saying things like, you know, I I was leading a, a dissolute life. I read your book. I started taking your advice and I've turned it around and now I'm doing much better in life. And, you know, I'm blessed to have much the same experience from a lot of people who listen to the show, people who have been home. That's like the, the, I'd say the most pernicious thing about Jordan Peterson is that like some of the advice is just, it's it's very generic. It's the stuff that like self-help people have been peddling for years. It's just repackaged as uh, some kind of mantra. But I mean, it is not bad advice to again, be the best version of yourself that you can be. But like statistically, you are going to have an infinitely harder time if you happen to have all these different kinds of oppression upon you uh, that are enforced through societal uh, stigmas. And uh, they can include having a lot more trouble getting a job if you're trans, having a lot more trouble uh, getting a job if you are queer in general, having a lot more trouble getting hired if you're a black American, uh, get a lot more trouble getting hired if you're an indigenous American or an indigenous Canadian in Canada. Same problems exist here as they exist in most Western democracies. Uh, it, it seems to be a constant theme. So rather than say this is 100% upon the individual, that every single one of you could just clean up your rooms a little bit more and pick yourself up from your bootstraps, then you would solve all of society these woes but we see what this like system when led to its natural conclusions where it leads almost who now have graduated harvard yeah it's, it's it's like it's good advice with bad politics it's a really good way of putting it bill casey school of people who were single moms and and then and then decided to to take a college course and and figure out their lives people who've made mistakes and turned their mistakes around and to me, those are inspirational stories. I think that because those insp they're inspirational stories for everybody that doesn't like ignore the larger problem. Inspirational stories exist. That, I think, is why people find you to be such a threat. It's because so many people are inspired by the stuff that you say and change their life individually without putting all of their ire and focus on a system that the left is mainly focused on tearing down. I defy anyone to go read 10,000 comments on my YouTube channels and not come <laughs> away uh, with a. <laughs> What a nightmare. Oh, no. <laughs> what a nightmare. Uh, I defy anyone to go read 10,000 comments on my I, I cannot imagine a more perfect tell, Mr. Peterson. PD. Much better with a much refreshed view of human nature. The comments are, in the main, unbelievably positive and not in a naive sense. They're positive in it. Yes, because again, they peddle a lot of the stuff to people who may be looking for these kind of answers, people who are miserable, and they're selling them solutions that rely completely 100% on just you, improving your life in every way, shape, and form, which again, innately is not bad advice. You can do both. You can both say that there are systems of oppression that we need to work and change, and also you should be the best version of yourself that you can be. Thoughtful sense, and, and in a communal sense, because the people who are making comments on the lectures are also commenting on each other. And there is ideological babble on both sides. I would say that's probably 5% of the comments. 
and uh, generally i believe they're written by there's the evidence i was looking for youtube comments yeah it's like imagine like what he's saying out loud is basically if you go and look at all my fans and see what my fans say about my work it's overwhelmingly positive and i mean the same thing would apply to anybody if, if you go and watch the things that people who like the surfs say in the comments it seems overwhelmingly uh, i'm i'm doing really good i'm giving really good advice the, the people who already have a parasocial relationship with my content or like the messaging because they like lefty shit it seems overwhelmingly that that, that, that i'm doing the right thing so the checkmate people who didn't actually watch the lecture because they're often out of context but in any <laughs> except his son his fans hate him <laughs> in any case 95 oh, percent of the comments are thoughtful but also extremely positive which is very rare in a social media comment landscape which tends to be very very toxic and so i think that's absolutely great and it certainly has to that be fair, as long as when I, when I read it. It's, it's a hate-hate um, hate relationship. But then here's something else that I, I've observed in the media attacks that have been directed towards me. They're not just directed towards me. They're, well, first, they're directed to who they think I am. So that's kind of interesting to begin with. But more than directed to me and more perniciously is that they're directed to those who are hypothetically following me. Now, I don't regard myself as someone with followers. I regard. Oh, I don't think we've ever done drunk Peterson too. Let's see this. Myself as someone with viewers, listeners, and readers, <laughs> and that's different. But in any yeah, we case, have. I forgot how good it is. <laughs> my typical follower. So goes the story, is a disaffected, angry, young, white male. Hmm, what a surprise. And for a while, I... <laughs> in some sense, pushed back against that and said, well... My audience is about 70% male, but YouTube skews male, so that's perhaps part of the reason. And I see no evidence that it's particularly limited racially or 91% uh, of those who view my videos are male. Why? Why? Why few women? Have you tried telling them about semen quality and IQ, Jordan? That's how you bring in the lady audience, you know? Just start teaching them about how semen quality correlates with IQ. That 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 was a normal thing for a human to think and then tweet out to, to all your followers. Yeah. Ethnically, especially when I <laughs> walk, see my lecture crowds and when I meet people on the street. But, but then I started to realize that that was the wrong response. The right response is, why does it disturb you so much that there's a group of people who by your own admission are disaffected and angry mm -hmm. and alienated and young and I'm helping them and why is that exactly a problem what is it that I'm supposed to be doing with them just out of curiosity what do you think if you had your druthers would I ignore them would no one talk to them is that actually what you want well the answer seems quite clear that that is exactly what's wanted that's what's held forth because there's this implicit assumption in all of this critique that in my very active aid, I'm doing something immoral. Immoral enough to be parodied, let's say, as Red Skull. <laughs> <laughs> He's still so mad about that. <laughs> he pretends not to be. He leans into the memes. I've seen it. All right. He sells Red Skull shit on his like uh, his website and they did all that kind of stuff. But like, <laughs> yeah, why? why? Why in the world would someone compare you to a fascist, Jordan Peterson? I wonder why. What the hell's going on here? It's like, what about what about all the self reflection that you always advocate other people do? Why why doesn't it ever apply to you? Why don't you ever clean up your room? Why don't, why don't you self reflect a little bit and realize why it is people keep saying that? Why is this such a popular criticism? Is it me or or is it the children who are wrong? At the end of the day, it's it's my critiques, uh, my critics. They're they're the ones who are wrong ultimately. I'm 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 changing the world. I'm saving lives. Why is that now uh, fodder for for parody or slander precisely? <laughs> 
<laughs> slander. <laughs> They're using your own quotes. <laughs> the, the meme works that you take a Red Skull picture and then you just put a line that Jordan Peterson says under it. And Jordan Peterson fans will do it with like the nicest things he says. It'll be like, yeah, pet a cat, you know. And then when I make them uh, on the other direction, I'll use all the weird shit he says. Like uh, the semen thing, you know. Like, hey, semen and IQ quality. Uh, listen up, ladies, you know. The, 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 then, it, then it's funny. I mean, do you debate the fact that I'm helping? Well, you go read the comments yourself and see what you think. And so then, and then I thought about that a bunch. Too. I thought, well, <laughs> what is it with, with men, the men that I'm speaking to, let's say, um, why are they responding positively? Why did they come to my lectures, the biblical lectures, even, I mean, which is very wrong. surprising, right? Because what the hell are men doing in a biblical lecture, especially young men, especially when they could go do anything else and they have to pay for it? It's like, what are they doing coming to this lecture? Well, if the patriarchy is an evil ty tyranny, then the appropriate attitude towards any male ambition is to not treat it as ambition, but to treat it as nascent drive to tyrannical power, which is certainly what uh, Foucault would recommend, for example, or Derrida, because it's all power. And so if you see some young man trying to stand up and better himself in any dimension, you're not going to trust that. You're going to identify that as the manifestation of tyrannical power. And clearly, if the patriarchy is a malevolent tyrant, clearly. then any sign of the desire to contribute it to it should be, at minimum, not encouraged, but more subtly criticized and discouraged at every possible opportunity. And that's our culture. <laughs> wow, he's so mad about this. Those Red Skull memes. Uh, keep making Red Skull memes is what I learned from that entire speech, everybody. Go go make a whole bunch more. It, it seems like uh, they're, they're having an effect. I guess I'll, I'll do a quick uh, Jordan Peterson lesson. What was the last thing we were learning about? Ah, yes. That was, that was a good day. It's been a while since we've done the drawing board. Okay, I'm just going to give a, a quick little lecture, uh, and this seems to be uh, one of the problems. So Jordan Peterson is saying out loud right now that he's like, why are people uh, so surprised that uh, my audience is primarily what are considered to be young, angry, white males? Uh, and, and why are they looking for guidance? Uh, and why uh, are people criticizing me for not helping them? And uh, what is the alternative, uh, say, from the left uh, to someone who happens to be white, male, and is online and is looking for guidance? And in some ways, there, it is true that the messaging on the part of the left or leftists have been kind of blurred by liberals. Liberals, uh, once they discovered terms and, uh, let's say, so some of the stuff that you might learn under CRT, such as privilege, uh, have been running with that. And they're writing whole books about it, white privilege and stuff like that, and screaming about it. So it looks like, uh, because the libs are often associated with the left, that on the other end, uh, what, what's the alternative to this, is people who are just yelling at me and making me feel shitty. That, like, you're, you're bad because you're white. You're bad because you're male and and there are these systems of white supremacy and hierarchies uh, and patriarchy and and they, they mean that you are innately evil because you're white or you're innately evil because this is the way the right has been trying to reframe the whole thing and what has been lost so when you hear things like uh hold on let me bring up the glossary when you hear things like let's say white privilege so it, it, it's it's resulting in in, in this right because the term white privilege is being interpreted as you have a whole bunch of magical superpowers because you're white and uh, you have to acknowledge those and then you have to check them. You, you must check them. Uh, and there are uh, people who are pushing back on this right now in terms of a form of messaging because uh, ultimately it is resulting in more people turning away from what could be actual beneficial things in terms of learning about this kind of stuff. So I'm going to do a controversial thing on the left, all right? I'm going to say we're not going to do... We're not going to do this anymore. I put out. Uh, we are all oppressed. There are different forms and vectors of oppression. It's a little more wordy. Doesn't roll off the tongue quite as much as the other one. But what does the term white privilege do for someone who happens to be white and poor? What does teaching someone who is white and poor about white privilege doing? To say that, hey, by the way, just so you know, you have a lot of advantages in society uh, because you're white and you should acknowledge them and check your privilege. So saith me, the elitist liberal living in a mansion somewhere, right? That, that That's where you fall into a lot of problems with this thing. Whereas, if you were to explain to people the truth, which is that we are all oppressed in a variety of ways. Different people are oppressed for different things. You can be oppressed uh, for your race in this country. You can be oppressed for your class. 
in this country. You can be oppressed for a variety of things, for your sexuality. You can be oppressed for being trans, for your gender identity. There are a lot of things where you can be oppressed, and you can be oppressed for combinations of those things. It's not an Olympics thing where someone is trying to have more oppression than the other person. We're just saying, broadly speaking, there are various forms of oppression that happens, and a lot of them happen to do with things out of your control, and things that uh, sometimes are just completely made up, like race. Yeah, we just made it up. There's no such thing as race. All human beings are the same. Uh, so we, we've uh, characterized them based on some characteristics like the color of their skin, uh, and that's uh, how we try to group uh, groups of people when it has no basis in biology. So the truth being that there are uh, most likely going to be forms of oppression levied against the majority of people uh, born into society with, uh, you know, obviously there are exceptions of people who have absolutely no oppression whatsoever, but uh, for the most part, you are probably going to be oppressed for class uh, if you are born into a poor family or you're born even into a middle-income family these days. And because of that, yes, you can be oppressed for your class. Someone who is also oppressed for their class and is black or indigenous will be oppressed for their class and then they will also be oppressed for being black. They will have a harder time uh, getting a job or a job interview because of that. They will have a harder time, uh, you know, uh, uh, when dealing with a police officer uh, because of the color of their skin. So there are a variety of ways. That doesn't mean that you too are not having a hard time. That doesn't mean that you too, while you are being white in society, uh, are not experiencing what you feel is some magical form of privilege, right? You're just like, well, I've had a shitty life my entire life. I've had to work my ass off. I've had, like, I'm working two jobs. I grew up in a poor family and I have never felt privilege. I've never felt privileged. I've felt that life is really fucking hard. Well, that is all 100% true. And and to continuously tell people that, hey, by the way, you have to check your privilege at the door. Uh, by the way, just acknowledge that you are white. And it's like, yeah, but I'm white and I'm working class and I'm poor. This shit is, this shit is still very, very tough, right? This would, in my opinion, be a better way to explain that than continuously just trying to be like, hey, by the way, check your privilege. Hey, by the way, recognize your privilege. You have to understand it. Is that there is oppression in a variety of forms and that people can be oppressed for a variety of things. And those who tell you that all of this is made up, that all of this is nonsense, that you have to look inward and that it's you who has to change, that it's you is the problem. They're going to ignore the broader problems inherent to capitalism because there is a relationship in capitalism between the owning capitalist class and the employees or the workers. And that relationship is going to expand and multiply as there is time on more people are engaging in this economic system. That there's that uh, people who are the workers, they are going to have a harder time, uh, most likely than the people who are the owning class. And that intersects with things like race. It is going to be easier if you are a white person than if you're a black person to get a loan. When you get that loan, it's going to be easier for you to start your business. When you start your business, you are then going to hire employees, and then you are going to become part of the ruling capitalist class. And so inherent to this very system is going to be contradictions and inequality that is built right into it, even though it is a better system than slavery, even though it is a better system than feudalism. That much is true. But I mean, again, that bar is so low, it's in the center of the earth. So there is a better system than capitalism, and then there's one that is not going to replicate as much oppression as capitalism and that's where I would like to open the door and start talking to all of you about socialism because it's not as scary it's not as scary as you may think you may have heard that it just makes you eat rats in Venezuela and that's the only thing that ever happens with socialism but what we're really talking about is we're trying to remove that dynamic that relationship between the employer and the employee and give workers the means of production give them more democracy I would say in summary if I was to explain socialism it is about maximizing freedom and you love freedom don't you I mean, come on, everyone loves freedom. We want to maximize freedom. There's too many mini dictatorships going on in the world. Little small corporate dictatorships all the way to massive corporate dictatorships in which thousands upon thousands, sometimes hundreds of thousands of workers have no say in their jobs, have no say in their lives. They just go to work every single day. And as a result of having to go to work every single day, they have people who are making decisions on their behalf that directly impacts their lives. Now, you wouldn't stand for that in the political process. If, if it was in politics and we said, hey, by the way, we're just going to have one dictator hopefully they're benevolent but yes you do not get a say you don't get a vote in this respect well you would say i i don't like this system i thought i thought we're post enlightenment and we we live in a liberal democracy cannot we have a little bit more democracy in the place where i spend the majority of my day half my day sometimes in in the workplace and i say yes i i would like to maximize your freedom i would like to expand your freedom and so we open the door we open the door to to new people and also clean up your rooms 
because it'll make you feel better. It's 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 good to have a clean room, you know. The, the, you you actually there's piles of dead skin that you don't think about, so we should clean cleaner rooms and, and all that kind of stuff. And that's that's my TED talk. Yeah. And Vevezuela. We have, we do have to talk about Vevezuela. Do you enjoy the surfs but prefer not to have to use your eyeballs? Many are saying this. Well, we've got the solution for you. It's the Surf Times in podcast form. Available on most major podcasting networks now. If you enjoy it, please consider leaving a good review and feedback because it really helps the show out, apparently, and it's free. Just like the podcast. To our gods, Xander Corbis and Peyton L. Just, we are prepared to embark on a mighty jihad in your name. To our monarch, Tom Spiker, we are but your humble jester, attempting in vain to get you to laugh. To our valiant knights of the round table, Benji Arnie, Tech Tink, Scary Earth Human, Tony, DM Rivera, Resident Scarecrow, Sir Nickus, Mayred, Cheryl Alvarez, Ruby Kelly, Brandon, Words Greenwood, It doesn't matter what I believe, it only matters what I can prove, Hagbird Celine, Matthew Scarborough, Stellar Vision, Ariane McCarthy, Daniel Sutton, Coulter Smith, Jenna Tao, Quiet185, Anna Loves Riley, Omni, Riley and Anna, Poodlehawk, The Tim Caucus, Multimondi, Trevbot, EXE, Brian Ephraim, Lemmy101, Anthropophojack, Saren42, Catherine, Ramon Acosta, Incosin, Agent NDN, Violent Orchard, Political Puppy, La Media Panza, Zach Christensen, Todd Buckingham, and Todd Lajeunesse. We raise our mugs and salute our brave heroes off to another glorious conquest.